Dear Lord, it seems, it seems just moments ago, we stood in 2018. And what did you change the course of the movement? It's approaching three and a half years later. Lord, I pray that we will learn the lessons from this history. May we not lose sight of the seriousness of a failure to educate ourselves properly. of a failure to see love in the messages given. Of a failure to let the corrections change our hearts. Save your people, I pray, from the later seen condition. And I pray that you'll be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. So I last taught on January 1. And I didn't get through all of that that I wanted to cover. So this is really a completion of the January 1st presentation. We started, but we, did, we ran out of time. I chose to focus that presentation on 2014. Adventism identifies correctly that it's all about the Sunday law. Everything's all about the Sunday law. And as we walked out of the reform line of the priests, I wanted us to identify correctly what took place in that history. That it exists in two parts. 1989 to 2014. Except that 2014 exists. It's prophetic context. With all the implications for Adventism. For the United States for a final generation. Someone said recently, in someone else's presentation, where lots of people commented, and they should be grateful I wasn't there to answer them, I mean, a lot of the comments, not necessarily this one.
God led us with baby steps. I don't agree. If you think that this was baby steps, the reason we need to repeat the history, it is because it impacts how we behave now. This was not gentle. I would suggest this entire reform line is brutal. Two thousand and twelve is a neat example, but it's not the only one. If you're here, you predict two thousand and fourteen is the Sunday law. You find that it's about you and five other people. In a world of billions, that can't be right. Numbers matter. Okay. And then thirteen, fourteen. 14 passes, no Sunday issue, still no one agrees with you, Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. You're really lonely and you're not shaken because you know it's right. And people have been trying to get through, through to for three and a half years. Saying, don't talk about 2014, I want to know about Panium. And expressing doubt because it's January 2022 and I haven't laid it out yet. What would those people have done in 2012? This is not being led gently. You could argue that God is doing the best he can. But I see the tests this movement has faced as brutal ones. If that was not the case, more people would be here. But not one in 200 who's had an opportunity has accepted. because I don't think they found it gentle. Except the date exists. Wait four to five years. Start to see why. Start to see the content. 
and from 1989 to 2014. How was that prophetic history laid out? How did you understand the 2520? How did you understand any of that prophetic content here and here? People waited for God to lead and for it to be laid out by the mouthpieces he chose to work through. I don't think it's disconnected from sexism. Or the later same condition. That you get to this period. Female leadership. and the content and the vast majority of the movement who stay with the movement say thank you for the theme now we'll work equality out for ourselves and apply it how we want to. In 2019, how much of equality was understood? What was explained was no headship. no sexist standards in dress reform. God gave us two months only to internalize that. Before a new dispensation started, And God was going to define for his people how to understand the prophetic message of gender equality. And most of the movement turned off. Most of the movement weren't listening by then. weren't willing to allow God to open up what equality had to look like. Because now the message shone a light on their own character. And now the person holding the torch is female. And after just two months to listen, rewatch, absorb the German camp meeting,
what that was to look like prophetically had to be laid out. And the vast majority of people have decided to do that for themselves. To think the way Laodicean Adventists thought back here, when they said, we have our own personal experience, We will wait for God to tell us directly. Not through a human being. That's the same mindset that made Adventism reject the earlier messages. Twenty nineteen, Raffia. occurred throughout the year. As Putin took over more and more spheres of influence. Raffia. Feminism. External and internal. A Time Magazine headline from 2019. How Putin built a ragtag empire. Of tyrants and failing states. It was easily documented throughout the year. And the internal message towards the end of the year the internal date is August and September and the German camp meeting. Feminism. We enter a new dispensation. It's May of 2020. God is already warning us about the Apis Bull. To everyone thinking they're going to Wait for God to tell them directly what equality looks like. To say simply what God is telling them. What you've done is taken a little bit of the message, a little bit of God. Say, no, this is equality. Like Israel who said, this is the apis bull that led us out of Egypt. It is a representative of our God. But cast it in the mould of all the sexism they still wanted to keep. And I want to make one point here. Who messed up who? Did Israel go and mess up Egypt? And make Egypt sexist? 
or did Egypt mess up Israel? Because everyone's blaming Adventism. Everyone's blaming Christianity. Right from here, we should have been tracing it back. It's Egypt that did the damage to Israel, not the other way around. Was marked by death. The external. Internal, the warning. have to do the painful work of allowing others to identify your sexism. The same thing you were expected to do here. But didn't hurt as much. From May of 20, Apis Ball, internal, death, external. We come to about August 21. Here we find the end of the Afghanistan war. as predicted, and the subject of LGBT. I want to answer someone's question at this point in time. The person who asked this question asked it some time ago. And my difficulty in answering it privately is I don't think it's that simple. Some corners of the world over the last three years especially those heavily influenced by male leadership, have avoided teaching what I have presented. They have relied on their own material. Or they have taught Elder Parmindus and I strongly doubt they have taught that as he'd intended it. And the level of equality in these corners of the world give an indication of the results of the way they've chosen to teach. So I just want to answer a question, but I don't want to spend a long time on it. The person asked, we have accepted LGBT. He says members here in the ministry are asking if the movement will now accept bestiality.
and he said he wasn't sure how to answer them. Because maybe now that we have understood equality, maybe we would accept bestiality as a relationship. The reason I found that question difficult to answer is not because it doesn't have a very clear, simple answer, but because the root of the problem goes a lot deeper. What's the root of the problem with that question? If you have a human being, let's say you have this human being, and this human being is going to have a relationship with an animal. I'm not wanting to, to mock the question, I'm being very serious. If they were going to have a relationship with an animal, what does that relationship look like? Where would you put the animal? Would you put the animal here? Or would you put the animal here? In brief, is this a relationship of equals? Consenting equals? or of necessity, is this a relationship of headship? So people can say lots of reasons why it would be immoral. not natural, it's not how we were designed. The problem is, is those are the arguments used to argue against gay marriage. So I don't much care for those answers. My concern is when obviously multiple people have this question, in the late months of 2021, my concern is I believe they've gone through the following process. for their lives in a very strong fashion. It's been a man over a woman. And then we come to 2021 and we say homosexual relationships are 
good they've still got this model in their heads but they say okay doesn't have to be female Now you can have a man down here, passive. Now you can have a passive man. And it's only the places that hold to this. And the religions that hold to this that associate gay marriage, go from gay marriage to say you might as well have an animal. Or a child. Because they're all relationships of ownership control. No consent, no equality. If people understood the message of equality, if the members wondering this had have been taught the messages of equality, and spent two years changing their mindset. I'm not going to draw her with long hair and a skirt to make a female. But this is a woman. If they had have got that this existed was God's intent. They would never have seen gay marriage put a man here. Or a woman and woman. And started considering bestiality. which inevitably has to bring up the question of pedophilia. The only people who can go to that question are people who deep down believe that a woman in a relationship could ever have been replaced by an animal or a child. Because that's what they're saying. If you can lower a man to that standard. Can't you control animals as well? This is just some of the evidence. Some more obvious, some more subtle. Of the efforts once there was female leadership. to believe that God would teach them individually what equality looked like. It is 
also what happens when people do not approach the subject of LGBT squarely through the lens of gender equality. The order always mattered. Twenty twenty one, October twenty four. There's a presentation called Understanding Feminism. It is a preliminary study to a camp meeting starting on the about the 27th. Those dates might be different if you're outside of Australia. That camp meeting is going to cover radical feminism. What has already been taught about feminism from 2019 is going to get formalized. because that's what 2021 is. It's been growing since the German camp meeting. It's formalized in late October, 2021. I want to quote from a Wikipedia page. Uh, the the Russo-Ukrainian crisis. It's the page, I'm sure, being updated daily. on what is unfolding between Russia, Ukraine and the West. It says in October and November of 2021, Russia began amassing troops and military equipment near the border with Ukraine, creating an international crisis and generating concerns over a potential invasion. Third paragraph down, the crisis has been described by commentators as one of the most intense since the Cold War. The aggravation of Russian Ukrainian relations occurred in late October and early November and was provoked by the first combat use of a Ukrainian drone. It lists some other events that clustered around that same time period. Die ungefähr zum selben Zeitpunkt geschehen oder stattfanden. During the period of the, from the evening of October 29. In der Zeit um, vom Abend vom 29. Oktober. To the evening of October 31, two days. Bis zum Abend des 31. Oktober. The ceasefire regime in Donetsk, Donetsk Oblast. 
wurde das Waffenstillstandsregime im Gebiet Donetsk was violated 988 times. 988 Mal ähm, verletzt. And in Luhansk und in Luhansk 471 times. 471 Mal. In two days. In zwei Tagen. The foreign policy article from the end of 2021. In einem Artikel von foreign policy von Ende 2021. Said Putin ends the year on the center side stage. Heißt es, dass Putin das Jahr ähm, auf der großen, ja, im Mittelpunkt der Weltbühne abschließt. And as Biden pursued China. Und während Biden ähm, sich auf China konzentriert. For most of the year this looked very unlikely. Ähm, das sah für den Großteil des Jahres unwahrscheinlich aus. I just want to remind us very briefly what we teach. Ich möchte uns kurz daran erinnern, was wir lehren. World War I, World War II, kind of overlapping. Der Erste und Zweite Weltkrieg, die so wie überlappen. But this history is a period of time. Aber diese Geschichte, das ist eine Zeitspanne. In a way that 19 wasn't. So nicht wie 2019. And this is characterized by the Cold War on multiple lines. Und das hier trägt den Charakter des Kalten Kriegs in mehr, vielerlei Hinsicht. Foreign policy headline from last week. Eine, eine Schlagzeile von Foreign Policy von letzter Woche. A new Cold War to decide the future of Europe. Ein neuer kalter Krieg, der die Zukunft Europas entscheiden wird. And the world. Und der Welt. I haven't wanted to concentrate on Panium. I'm just putting something up very sim simply for structure. Ich wollte mich eigentlich nicht auf Panium konzentrieren, aber ich zeichne hier jetzt etwas Einfaches auf, um die Struktur zu zeigen. But the Supreme Court is also active in October. Auch der Supreme Court ist im Oktober aktiv. Regarding the, the court cases of Mississippi and Texas. Im Zusammenhang mit den Gerichtsverfahren in Mississippi und Texas. So we've seen Panium. Wir haben Panium gesehen. We're watching it play out. Wir, es spielt sich vor unseren Augen ab. Which it will do for some years. Und das wird einige Jahre gehen. We have compared it to 1989. Wir haben es mit 1989 verglichen. But we also need to contrast it with 1989. Aber wir müssen auch den Kontrast zu 1989 sehen. So often people get fixed on one and forget the other. Oftmals ähm, fixieren wir uns auf das eine und vergessen das andere. 1989 was like a new dawn for democracy. Anulo minus 29 was called a new Zipen zu Demokratie. People who wanted that regime to end. Pentru oamenii care doreau ca acel regime să se încheie comunist. Și rețeaua mondială a internetului ne-a oferit o nouă, o nouă posibilitate de a comunica. Iar acum avem dezinformarea. Oameni care susțin regimul prin felul în care rețeaua mondială a internetului a fost folosită ca o armă. Uh, fără speranță 
și da, să nu mai există speranță și există o cădere spre autoritarianism. Asta este tot ce am vrut să zic despre panium. Comparare și contrastare. Totul se totul conduce spre legea dominicală. Coming back to Coming back to the last two dispensations. From 2014 to 2019. The slow effort to introduce the basic concept of gender equality. Twenty nineteen to twenty twenty one. Whether or not people would be willing to have that laid out for them. Taught by prophetic methodology. Not through news articles. If this is a history of compromise, I should put it over the whole dispensation. From here to here, it's all about compromise. And we were given an external example. What was our external example? Democrat Party. Biden. So if this is all about compromise, If it's that important, where should you trace it to? Where did it come from? Don't say 2014. Where do you trace it to if it's that important? Yes. 1989. I want us to go back to 1989. Nineteen eighty eight, George Bush Senior wins the presidential election. A little context. In World War Two, you had Franklin D. Roosevelt. He was a Democrat. He led the United States till he died in 1945. 1945, he dies. From 1945 to 1988, a Democrat president has never won a second term. It's heavily dominated by the Republican Party. You 
You have a Democrat president in Qatar. People thought that was a disaster. In comes this attractive, charismatic Hollywood celebrity. Ronald Reagan. And the Democrats think it's okay to lose to him. He's so charismatic, what hope do we have? They lost it to him for a second term. I think, of course we have. It's Reagan. Even today, he has this cult of personality. So they're not that worried about their political party. But then in 1988, they lose to George Bush Senior. Not charismatic. Not this Hollywood glow about him. And the Democrats get scared. They could justify losing to Reagan. But it's been bad for half a century. The third loss in a row. And a couple of Democrats get together. And in 1989, they write a manifesto. It's called The Politics of Evasion. explaining the problems within their political party. And what they needed to do to fix them. One of the main authors, there was more than one, is a Democrat named William Galston. I'm going to quote from two documents. The first is the original manifesto. The second is an article that he wrote in 2013. Ref where he goes back and references that document. Because he's trying to give helpful advice now to the Republican Party. It, 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 the 2013 article does show he wasn't reading political events correctly. But that's a, a separate point. It just shows that his logic is very faulty.
The Democratic Party's 1988 presidential defeat demonstrated that the party's problems would not disappear as many had hoped once Ronald Reagan left the White House. Without a charismatic president to blame for their ills, Democrats must now come face to face with reality. Too many Americans have come to see the party as inatt inattentive to their economic interests, indifferent if not hostile to their moral sentiments, and ineffective in defence of their national security. This is from the 1989 document. This paper is an exploration of three pervasive themes in the politics of evasion. It then lists the three. Three myths that they need to fight. The first myth is the myth of liberal fundamentalism. They describe it. The first is the belief that Democrats have failed because they have strayed from the true and pure faith of their ancestors. The second is the belief that Democrats need not alter public perceptions of their party but can regain the presidency by getting current non-participants to vote, minority groups. It's the myth of mobilisation. We can keep angering all of the others if we just mobilise the minority groups will win. The third is called the myth of the congressional bastion. The third is the belief that there is nothing fundamentally wrong with the Democratic Party. There is no realignment going on and the proof is that Democrats still control the majority of offices below the presidency. Back to the 2013 article. We, the authors, were under no illusions that these changes would come without a fight. There was indeed a fight, but the changes happened. Skipping some.
holding onto control of Congress, permitted some Democrats to think things weren't that bad. They lost that majority in a couple of years' time, by the way. So, so in the summer of 1989, we sat down to write the politics of evasion, which the newly formed Progressive Policy Institute published that September. The essay was a frontal assault on three myths that Democrats had been using to explain away a series of dismal defeats. Our depiction of the party's political standing was blunt. Without a charismatic president to blame for their ills, Democrats must now come face to face with reality too many Americans have come to see the party as inattentive to their economic interests, indifferent if not hostile to their moral sentiments, and ineffective in national security. As is often the case when you set out to dispel cherished illusions, most of our fellow Democrats were not happy. For some years after, we were not very popular. There were, however, some important exceptions. Notably, a young governor from Arkansas with presidential ambitions, Bill Clinton and his allies, took the findings of the politics of evasion to heart and Clinton became the first Democratic president to win two terms in a row since Franklin D. Roosevelt. So the politics of evasion did not make the authors popular. Except in a small circle that took it to heart. What did Bill Clinton do to win a second term? It's actually a really long list. But two things on that list he did in 1996. Was sign the Defense of Marriage Act. And also attack immigration. Why is he doing those things? He had friends who were homosexual. He didn't like the act. Was this document correct? I want to argue they were. 
that was spot on. Their analysis is accurate. The fact that Clinton followed this document to win two terms is evidence that it works. We argued that there were simply not enough Liberals in the electorate to carry the party to victory. To win, it would need to both hold on to Liberals and attract a substantial majority of the moderate vote. Three years later, Bill Clinton sought to do that. Running for president as a new Democrat, he famously promised to end welfare as we know it, campaigned against outsized budget deficits and trade protectionism, and proposed to reinvent government, not expand it. I want to work backwards and just make some comment on these three myths. Could they make a great difference if they just tried to hold the lower offices? That gets debunked. Could they win if they just mobilised enough minority groups? A bit more now than then. But then absolutely not. The demographics have changed over the last 30 years. But it's their first myth that bears, should take most of our attention. Reading from the 1989 document. From point six, the myth of liberal fundamentalism, some of the way down. It is clear that the Democratic Party is actually a moderate liberal coalition party and not a liberal party, a positioning likely to yield positive results in the years to come. Worst of all, while insisting that they represent the popular will, contemporary Liberals have lost touch with the American people. During its heyday, the Liberal governing coalition brought together white working class voters and mi minorities with a smattering of professionals and reformers. Over the past 20 years, however, Liberal fundamentalism has meant a coalition increasingly dominated by minority groups and white elites.
So what they're saying is the party is trying to be do, too liberal fundamentalist. And because of that, they haven't attended to the needs of the middle class, white working demographic. The second excuse used to avoid confronting the need for a comprehensive review of the policies of the Democratic Party is it's all race. According to this thesis, the major themes of the past two decades, which Republicans have exploited so effectively, are all products of and codes for racial divisions. Whatever the ostensible issue, crime, public safety, the death penalty, jobs, the real issues a race because the Democratic Party has embraced the right but unpopular position on racial justice. It has paid a heavy price among voters who do not share this view. I want us to see the subtlety of it. The Democratic, one of the main themes for the Democrat Party is there's an issue with crime. There's an issue with racism. There's an issue with jobs. There's a main component of, of racism. Nothing can be done about this, continues the argument. Repositioning is out of the question because it would come at the expense of the party's moral integrity. Democrats' duty then is to stand fast bear witness, take their lumps, and hope that the American people will eventually agree with them. No one should doubt the continuing power of racial conflict in American politics. But it is one thing to say that race matters, and quite another to say that it dominates everything. So they're saying, no, we get it, we agree, race is important. No one should doubt that racial conflict continues to be a continuing issue. But it's one thing to say that racism matters. It's another thing to say that it dominates everything. It's tough on crime, that isn't a race issue, is it?
Go back to African and American newspapers from the day. Magazines. Go back to their leaders. Go back to their voting records. There was plenty calling for a war on drugs. Saying, lock them up for life. War on drugs, that's not racism, is it? We agree that it matters. But do you just want to hand the entire country to the Republican Party? And just hope that at some point you'll change people's minds? So it's one thing for us to say that sexism matters. Remember, it's end of 2019. From here to here. It's one thing to say that sexism matters. But it's another thing to say that liberal feminism is sexist. That the beauty industry is sexism. That the dowry system is gender slavery. that the way members interact with female leadership is sexist. That the root of homophobia is sexism. Sexism isn't everything, is it? Hasn't been the problem in your ministry? In your behavior? In the messages you sent to women? In a question about bestiality? It's not sexism to look at 1888 and 1850 and say, even though it's God who lined up 1850s slavery to 1940s Holocaust, to 2020s sexism. If that seems extreme to you, I didn't do that. That didn't come from me. That's God's compare and contrast. That's God showing how serious it is. Let's skip 1888. 
By the way, 1888 is not the National Sunday Law. It's a history like Panium, it's warning of, but it is not the National Sunday Law. And A.T. Jones isn't holding back. I'm not calling for public evangelism. But so much of the language of tolerance, gentleness, grace, leading people gently, Don't drop everything at one time. Start with Seventh-day Adventists. That's fine. I agree. I'll restart my point. We're discussing 1989 and democratic compromise. We're discussing how the party shifted in 1989. How that shift allowed them to regain some political power in Washington. And one of the points made was that they're too fundamentalist. They're making issues about race when they kind of aren't. We, of course, believe in grace and love. But over and over and over again in this movement, those arguments are code for the Laodicean condition. One of the benefits of wanting to understand Ellen White's position on gender was reading extensively of her writings. Not just of gender, but of anything I could find And if you want to throw a quote in the chat, as has been done in other presentations. Talking about the need for humility and tolerance. I'll send a whole heap of quotes back where she doesn't seem humble or tolerant. There is nothing better that Laodiceanism is better at than taking Ellen White out of context. misunderstanding her work, and then posting quotes about grace and love. I 
I know that when I'm sharing quotes of hers, I only have time for one. But I trust it because of the weight of writings that back up the application I make of that quote. In August, September of 2019, we're at the German camp meeting. It's Sabbath. Different language groups divide for Sabbath school. The United States takes one group. They all discuss grace and love and tolerance. Completely losing sight of the prophetic message. Or the point in history they had arrived at. A few days later, their leader says he's returning to Laodicea. And all those with grace, love and tolerance said, Amen. I would suggest they had never left. The mindset was still there. And it gets made so subtle. But ever since late 2019, what Elder Paminder and I have been fighting in this movement is the later seen condition. I would argue it's stronger now than it's ever been. And it's not intolerant people pointing out others' mistakes. It's not rude women. Saying, stop saying, sister. The later scene responders women as well as men saying, first. You called out my sexism and you made me feel bad. That's conservatism, doesn't it? Only conservatism makes you feel bad. So the arguments develop subtly around this type of thinking. Must have success with Adventism and the world. Can't win a presidential election Can't make a difference. Come on, Democrat Party. 
Sexism isn't in this issue, my favourite issue. My lack of support to female Bible word workers is only my personality. If you don't make meet people where they're at, you'll never win an election and be able to gently coax the American public a little further forward. Not saying we're not nice to people. You can say the truth really nicely. And it still won't look nice or humble if it's cutting and hurt someone. But just win an election, meet the people where they're at, get them in, then you can just start coaxing them further and further and further. So of course we're going to be nice. We're not talking about beating someone over the head. My problem isn't necessarily what you're going to want to say to other people. Because the priests have such hurt feelings over this history. Frankly, this isn't even about what they think the Levites will do. This is how this group of people feel about having their sexism pointed out. Must have success with Adventism and the world. This was very strong at the beginning of 2020. When people started criticizing good advice. Because you won't win people. Criticize the Sabbath, you won't win people. They won't vote for you. Criticize the use of the charts. They won't vote for you. It's more subtle, but the same arguments are made today. So it gets masked with grace, love and tolerance. And the whole point is, sexism isn't everything. Elder Tess isn't pointing out a prophetic message about the Sunday Law Test. She is a woman screaming in a restaurant. About a little fly on her shoulder. Waiting for that good male waiter to come and shoe the fly for me.
so I can stop hysterically screaming about gender equality. I guess even those who oppose my work like to use parables. But sexism isn't everything. And even in that story of a hysterical screaming woman, they don't see their own sexism. Ellen White said from the beginning of her ministry, every single time she corrected someone, They claimed she'd been inappropriately influenced by others. And one of the latest examples of someone telling me I'd been inappropriately influenced. Then went and posted the following. Science has proven men can only unconditionally love a woman. And science has proven that women can only unconditionally love a child. was that despite what is not hidden, if the blind have learnt to see, I am not being inappropriately influenced when I question whether or not gender equality has been taught properly. What is the Laodicean condition? You may complain, I throw quotes. But I've read enough to choose these as fitting the context Ellen White gives. Notice the confusion people have with her work. In my last vision, I was shown that even this decided message of the true witness had not accomplished the design of God. The people slumber on in their sins. They continue to declare themselves rich and having need of nothing. Many inquire, why are all these reproofs given? Why do the testimonies continually charge us with backsliding and with grievous sins? We love the truth. We love equality. We are prospering. We are in no need of these testimonies of warning and reproof. I put equality in there. We love equality. We love the midnight cry. 
by prospering as a movement, aren't we? No, we're not. Why don't you just talk about Panium? Just give us a date. It's the formalization for the Sunday law. Don't you know the date yet? I'm not presenting this because it's all I have to teach. I'm presenting this because this is where my priorities lay and I believe that that is prophetically accurate. What's the latest end condition? It's blindness. What does Ellen White say, say is the greatest reason that people are blind? The greatest reason that people today are laid to sin? I have been shown that the greatest reason why the people of God are now found in this state of spiritual blindness is that they will not receive correction. It's offensive to them. Many have despised the reproofs and warnings given them. The true witness condemns the lukewarm condition of the people of God, which gives Satan great power over them in this waiting and watching time of Raphia to Panium. The selfish, the proud, and the lovers of sin are ever assailed with doubts. Satan has ability to suggest doubts and to devise objections to the tolerant, gentle testimony that God sends. Pointed testimony. She doesn't say tolerant. Many think it a virtue, a mark of intelligence to be unbelieving and to question and quibble. Those who desire to doubt will have plenty of room. God does not propose to remove all occasion for unbelief. He gives evidence which must be carefully investigated with a humble mind and a teachable spirit, and all should decide from the weight of evidence. You can look behind you at the weight of evidence. And you have to decide for yourself. Whether it's Laodicean and conservative. Someone to correct you. They stop calling us brother and sister.
making you uncomfortable. Pointing out things that are clearly encouraging a continued misogyny within this movement. Pointing out things that are continuing the misogyny within this movement. That the essence of Laodiceanism is an unwillingness to receive correction. And it's framed as a worry for the Levites and the Nethanims that will mess up. Covered over with ideas of grace, love and tolerance. God is not more tolerant today than he was 10 years ago or a thousand years ago. What he's doing is pointing out what he's intolerant of. And then the argument, sexism isn't everything. Lots of other cases, but not mine. In this case, you've just been influenced. We love equality, lay off. Everything worth possessing in this world must be secured by effort. We've gone down a way. 13. Halfway through. Come. And sometimes by most painful sacrifice. And this is merely to obtain a perishable treasure. Shall we be less willing to endure conflict and toil and to make earnest efforts and great sacrifices to obtain a treasure which is of infinite value and a life which will measure with that of the infinite, can heaven cost us too much? But for many, their treasured point of view is too much. Pride is too much. This applies to women as well as men. Because the second author of the politics of evasion was a woman. And I hear from women all the time, the same sexist arguments that I hear from men. If you were to go to the vows, the first quote, is Isaiah 1.11. For what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and of the fat of fed beasts 
and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. People are asking, how am I going to the Levites? What do I have to do to go to the Levites? The movement already is. We already have received a degree of attention, not before. Our position on gender and LGBT has been noticed. But if you're unwilling to work with leadership, to do what's necessary to assist with the work for the priests, Objecting to correction. Justifying misogyny. It's like someone after four years of not studying not passing the exams Say, when do I get a scalpel? When do I get to operate? When do I get to operate on someone? Tell me when and how I'm going to do that. My response is it's not your job, you won't. Do the first work. The first work is important. It isn't that we ignore love, basic Christianity. But consider slavery, Holocaust and sexism. Consider the fact that you're proud that Bates called himself an abolitionist. And no one is saying, oh, that's terrible. It wasn't 1850 yet. He didn't lead the plantation owners gently enough. I'm not concerned about the work that the organisation does for the Levites. I'm concerned about individual priests. I'm concerned about their spiritual journey. If you have a problem with leadership, talking Continental and Elder Paminder and I, God will never remove all your reason for doubt. You have to look at the weight of evidence. Decide if our priorities over the last three years have fitted with the seriousness of the message. There are people in leadership who need this as well.
men and women. There's a lot less of it now. There's a lot less of it now. Because most of them don't talk to me anymore. But I'm going to keep being that screaming woman in a restaurant for as long as it takes. I've said a lot in, in two hours. It's a problem of so little time to speak now. It means things need to get said simply and hope that they're not misunderstood. Just talk to us. Right to Elder Pami. There's a problem, we can address it. But whether people are confused as to why I keep talking like this or no, This movement has a problem with the later seen condition. The later seen condition is another way of saying a history of compromise. We pinned compromise prophetically to the time of the end. and used two methods of defining it. First, we used the external, the politics of evasion. Their arguments that we see reflected in the movement Second, Ellen White. Just touched the tip of the iceberg. Of what she has to say about the latest condition. It's a big subject. But it's all about whether or not we're willing to see our character exposed. And corrected by this message. And see that that is love. Because it's salvation. Or close in prayer. Dear Lord, we want this movement to be successful. May we not try and make it more successful through compromise. May we look at our own hearts. Be willing to have sexism pointed out. And may we see love in that message. Love in whatever changes our hearts and fits us for heaven. Pray, Lord, you'll help your people escape this condition. for their own sake.
and also because we don't want to take this message alone. Selfishly, I'd rather fight with an army. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.